Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode. I'm quite excited today because we're going to talk about leadership, which is really, I would say, a, a topic that people seem to really connect with very quickly. Uh, a lot of people have opinions about it. And I find also a lot of misunderstandings. So yeah, it's a, I think it's very juicy. So I'm quite excited for us to dive into that today and to look at it from a couple different angles. And yeah, I guess one thing that I thought maybe could be interesting um, or that I'm personally quite curious about is I guess, Susan, you've obviously spent a lot of your career working in large corporations. And Lisa, you've been a consultant for a large part. I think you've been working independently most of your uh, career, but with a lot of traditional organizations as well. And for me, having not really had that experience, I'm especially, I guess, curious about how you've experienced leadership throughout the course of your professional life. Like, what was it like in those other contexts? Um, what were maybe some beliefs also that you had about leadership back in the day, if that's the right word? And how has that shifted since since we've all been working together in the space of more participatory and cooperatively held organizing and, and what's different? So yeah, I thought maybe we could use that to just dive into this very meaty topic and then see what interesting things we want to share. Yeah, I'm happy to kick us off. It's um, as I'm running the history of my experience with leadership um, through my career, it's just occurring to me like, you couldn't make this stuff up. Like I have literally seen everything. So if I think about my, my you know, my very first job, 17 years old for a tech startup back in the days when the words tech startup weren't even in the vocabulary, um, working for a small business where the owner um, was like my second dad and gave me lots of opportunities to learn everything about business. And I'll, 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 I'll always um, be indebted um, to, to Bill for that. But very much not only uh, in a hidden way treating me like a child, but very much treating me like his daughter <laughs> to um, the next scenario where the leader in the business, we'd have our, our, our sales meetings or our staff meetings every uh, week in the big boardroom. And it took me a while to understand what he was doing, but every week he would, he would get into somebody like really, really in front of everybody, just completely bollock and bash and yell and slam his fist. And I'm thinking, is this leadership? Is this, is this how, is this supposed to be motivating me? This is, but at the time I was thinking, oh gosh, this is what the boss does to like keep the troops going. And I just, yeah, I wish I had had the consciousness about it then. <laughs> um, and then when I, when I moved into these bigger, larger multinational organizations uh, that were uh, led by always uh, middle-aged white men who led in the way that striving to create a sense of fealty to them, that they know better, they're the boss, and really projecting their version of good onto me. I, I've told this story a lot. Um, uh, and it's happened to me twice in my life where where the boss has said to me, um, Susan, you're never going to rise up the ranks because you say what you think. And like literally he said he said this to me and mm -hmm. that then changed my version of leadership again. It's like, OK, leadership means closing your mouth, not saying what you think towing the party line and that's the only way you're going to be able to climb climb the ladder and then thankfully um after that kind of first foray in the corporate world went back to the startup world where it was much more generative there was much more shared and dynamic leadership um and then that was like sort of my last role in the, in in Europe before I came to New Zealand and then in New Zealand found the same thing again with fealty to the leader don't 
rock the boat. Um, the leader's job is to keep the ship stable. I know what I'm doing. I don't care if you're smart or if you've got good ideas. This is, this is what we do. And I think that that was more or less my experience of leadership um, until I finally decided to leave the corporate world. I'm just curious, Lisa, did you have similar um, relationships with leaders or was it different for you? It was really different. I never encountered one that was a bully directly. I mean, I know that, I know that's like a really common story. Pretty much everyone I talked to has had that experience. For me, I had pretty good examples of leaders. Um, and I noticed over time though, that the, the, the way they lead and, and, and the source of their power um, is pretty fragile because it was, there were sort of like two flavors of leaders. One, were, one was the leader that was a content expert in something. That's how they got to where they were. And that kind of leader was really good at protecting their people, like keeping mm. their people all together, especially through reorganizations and that sort of thing. And so like, so that's what I would have said is a really successful leader. And I'm, now obviously that's not a great strategy for your whole life because you cannot be a content expert in everything coming down the pike and, and things are changing so fast. It's just unrealistic that someone would be. Um, and then the whole idea of, of having to be the smartest person in the room is really limiting. But, but that was sort of like one of the, the patterns that I saw. <clears throat> and the other pattern was leaders that were really, really good at developing their people. And I had several of those. My first boss out of college, uh, I'll say his name because I honor him so much, Steve Shenefield. I don't even know if he's still on this planet, but if he is and he ever hears this, he needs to know how much I've would just treasure what he gave me. And then other people along the way, very, very good at developing their people, but I noticed that they did not rise in the ranks. So that it was like this real thing about content expertise and protecting mine, whatever mine meant. And so, um, you know, I just was striving to try to be a content expert in everything for the longest time. You know, and finding out that I, uh, I wasn't really good at <laughs> a lot of the things and a lot of the content we were working in. What I was good at is the how we're working and who we're being as we're working together part of it, you know. So uh, I never, I didn't realize that I didn't fit that mold until I encountered the agile world. When I could start to see that there was a different way that we could, that, that leadership is actually a shared attribute, not something imbued into one person. It's so interesting, right? I mean, that what you were sharing about protecting, keeping the, keeping, keeping, keeping the gang together. I've seen it manifest like that a lot, but also like the leader having the power of deciding what to share and what not to share, how much context to share and how much not to share with this kind of uh, mindset of, I need to protect my people from the truth so they can just keep on focusing on what they do and how that power of context really, really limits um, the potential of the team and the organization, but bottlenecks with that, with that one person and having been that person so many times, um, I really feel empathy and sympathy for that person, that, that person, right? Because there's so much pressure so much, um, so much un, um, both unconscious and unnamed power that is imbued upon this person. Everything from getting to decide how much people get paid or what kind of work they get to do or um, what kind of development they get to do. I was never told that that was something that leadership was right and then suddenly finding oneself in that position and all of that pressure um no no wonder middle managers need to compartmentalize and protect and and figure out strategies for doing this um it's 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 really in inhumane and yeah. it's almost like well what do you expect if you're yeah. putting all all of these all of these pressures on on people with these titles. 
You're reminding me of my last job as a middle manager, as a project management office director of an organization. And the six months that I lived a dual life, knowing that some percentage of the people in my group were going to be laid off. And I had to decide who it was. And I would be looking at them in the face, knowing as soon as I get the word, I have to tell you, you don't have a job. But in the meantime, I have to pretend like it's all fine. You know, and this is this is the attention, like this double life I was leading for six months. I mean, it, it was really affecting my health. That was the last role I held as an employee in my career. I said, that's it. I, it's not for me. Wow, that sounds really tough. <laughs> it's interesting because I feel like I've seen a bit the flip side of that in some of the self-management transformation work we've done where you know we're encouraging to say yes share the information openly even if it's difficult trust the people that they can hold it or that we're gonna build capacity in them for, for them to be able to cope with that hmm. but still at first there being this real moment of shock of like oh my god so shock on the part of the employees in this case that aren't used to be getting so much information and then might be up at night worrying about the business because they know now that, oh my God, our runway might run out soon or that, yeah, like mm -hmm. that things aren't going well. And I guess I've definitely sometimes suffered or doubted what we're doing when you see how many people are suddenly all taking on these, these difficult uh, realities and needing to deal with them. But at the same time, seeing how for the manager... <laughs> or the leader, it's way better. And they usually feel extremely relieved because they're not carrying it all on their own shoulders. So I think to me, that's somehow a real, real challenge because I think there's just such a deep pattern of not being used to being given even that level of information and then sort of panicking a bit sometimes or not knowing how to, how to process it because you just, you're not used to it. And I think to me, it reminds me a bit of some of the work we try to do with money as well on, in terms of being transparent about finances. It's like, if you see them, you actually know exactly like how we're paying the salaries and what are the trade-offs and what are we, you know, if we give you a raise, we lose it somewhere else. That I think is something that you need to get quite used to looking at regularly. And that it's, it's sort of a, a posture that one can grow into quite a lot but it's maybe a bit of a stretch at first. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I tie it back to what Lisa was just sharing about like holding that, you know, um, I'm going to need to cut 20% of, of team members because our, our budgets or our projections were out of whack or something's happened. That means that we're not going to be able to um, balance the books. It, if and when everybody in the organization is given access to that, I personally think that the pros outweigh the cons, that if we're all looking at the same information, understanding the realities, all of a sudden you've got incrementally more brains on how to solve the problem, um, how to um, how to mitigate e either the inevitable or change the outcome. And so as it's just like anything, right? At first, it's like uh, you can't even breathe. And then if that is backed up with the practices of being able to build the capacity in everybody to then wrangle with this, it reminds me of, you said this to me last week, Fran, that, you know, how we always say that if it's not um, documented, it's not open source. Well, it's, it's all well and good for it to be documented, but unless it's digestible, digestible, accessible, and we can make meaning of it, then it's pointless as well. Hmm. Yeah, everything we're talking about just reminds me of like there's, there's this one critical inflection point, which is moving from a parent child relationship to an adult adult relationship in a nutshell. Because that whole thing about protecting people about the financials, and then and then like, on a day you lower the boom and like 30 people 30% 30 of the of this people have to leave the building, you know, like, that's super traumatic. Um, but it comes from that that mode of like, I somehow have to protect people from the reality. Mm -hmm. um, and I like what you're saying, Susan, about like, if you if we can 
presume that people are adults and we can help actually help them develop the capacity to, as you're saying, Fran, deal with this level of information all the time without freaking out, then we have all these minds now on the problem. And I, I think about Herb Kelleher and this like sort of iconic story about Southwest Airlines where they had they were going to have to lay off a huge number of people. And he sent out a letter saying, okay, if you all take a pay cut of it was something fairly small, like $10 or something, a, a pay period, then we can keep you all on. Well, that was lovely. It's sort of a like a heroic story of like this heroic, amazing leader, but also like how parental is that? I mean, like he gave them an option. <laughs> You know, so I, yeah. you know, I'm looking at that now, like at that at the time when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's such a great leader. And now I'm looking at it through the eyes of shared leadership and saying like, yeah, that's still a little bit icky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because I feel like in some of the contexts where we're talking about shared leadership, that many people sort of have this misconception that leadership is about sort of taking control and suddenly being in that parent-child dynamic. And that when we say shared leadership, that what we mean is just that more people are doing the taking control and they're sort of taking turns in doing it. <laughs> and I just, I find that quite interesting because it, I mean, another, another terminology, obviously that's very common here is uh, Mary, Mary Parker Fullett's power power over versus power with which you know obviously she developed this in the 20s already and it's a uh, very universal uh knowledge and uh i think was probably rediscovered a bit late but yeah i think i, I really find that uh on a practical level it seems that people really struggle with what the shift from power over to power with means i i really found that to be something that yeah uh people sort of might be very, um, yeah, controlling or commanding and thinking that that is, that is leading. And uh, yeah, that just not really being what we're trying to get to, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I think that, I, I think that it, it, it also, like, again, I have empathy because that, that control or that command authority way of being is, doesn't always come from a bad place. It, it sometimes comes from a place of, I can see the target. I know how to get here. If I, if I can just distribute the tasks from my own brain, I know that this will work, right? Rather than the sense or the possibility of, I might not be the only one, or this might not be the only way. Because my, our friend Doug Kirkpatrick says that with great um, freedom comes great responsibility. And so once you have access to the facts or the data or whatever, um, how do we then, or how do leaders then make the next move, which is to not have to be holding all of this responsibility themselves? Hmm. Because that's, that's, that's really the, the, and I know for myself, like the manifestation of I'm holding a lot and I know that I am the only one responsible at the end of the day, I can definitely get very commanding and very controlling because this is on my shoulders. It's not on your shoulders. So if step one is sharing the information, step two is starting to share the responsibility. And that is, that can be even harder. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose the uh, good news, bad news of this is that the world is going to continue to serve up more and more complex challenges to leaders, and yeah. they're going to have less and less of an opportunity to successfully use that strategy of holding it all on their shoulders and holding all the information. Because it's it's not like the old days where you actually could make a decision and tell people what to do, and it actually worked. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there was a time when it acted, when that was at least a good portion of the time, pretty good strategy, and now. The, you know, so now we're in this evolutionary swing. I think this is a part of the context we need to bring in. Like when Susan and I started in our careers, things were, things were Way definitely different. simpler and maybe they were complicated, but they were certainly not complex and confounding like they are now. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the old strategies just don't work as well. And that's where I have a lot of compassion for leaders. And when I work with leaders, 
you know, helping them confront the fact that, you know, what they've been doing this whole time may have worked and is unlikely to keep working because the mm-hmm. context has changed so much. The environment has changed so much. Everything's exponential. Yeah. It's interesting because I've just noticed that uh, we're, we're doing one of the, the pitfalls around leadership, which is where you, we're, we're talking about leaders <laughs> like as, a, as an identity. Ha, right? ha, 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 you caught oh. us. <laughs> which, yeah, obviously, I guess part of what we're trying to move towards is something that is more of a verb, right? Or an adjective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I find it interesting that it's it's so easy to sort of conflate like the CEO, the manager, leader, the boss, all of that sort of in one mm-hmm. when we're trying to actually look at that as a more distinct yeah. way of showing up. Yeah, I think I heard this term in coaching school uh, for the first time, but I use it a lot just to break the cycle of that. I talk about developing people's leaderfulness. I know that's not actually a word, but it it sort of works to break the mold of like that leadership is a thing and some people have it and some people don't. Um, And that, and that we all be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if that word does get added to the dictionary at some point, somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I find it quite useful. Yeah. So you've used it too? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we, yeah. Yes. Okay. That's great. I love, I love to see our backgrounds converging here. Like, Susan you know, first. Yeah, yeah. She used it a lot and then I picked it up. So. Oh, that's funny. I love it. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I guess that also uh, leads into this posture of like leaderfulness and followership. Like how can we be, and, and how, like, I don't know the exact amount of extra lift that when geese are flying in formation, it makes it, I don't know, 30% easier. Um, uh, to fly in the draft of another and knowing that that's constantly changing. And then the overall capacity of the whole flock grows exponentially because that collective action is adding that extra lift. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just love that, uh, the, that metaphor so much that if one, if one goose is flying in the lead all the time, they're eventually going to fall out of the sky and it doesn't need to be that way. And they figured it out. So we need to figure it out. <laughs> Learn from them, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the idea, I was just talking to somebody yesterday, actually, in an org that we're working with that, um, you know, if you were looking at a traditional org chart, they would be, you know, not near, quote unquote, the top, but expressing to them, like, like how grateful I am for their leadership in this particular dimension and them saying, Oh, do you really think I'm a leader? And just like that, that tenderness of being, being recognized. And then it actually being really obvious to them that actually, yes, I am a leader in this dimension and it adds value to the, to, to what we're doing collectively. And I, you know, I think, as I said before, even though I've had some really horrible bosses, 98%, I'm just making this number up, of, of leaders or bosses are kind, benevolent, well-intended humans that need our support to be able to trust, you know, back to this thing of holding everything on their shoulders. And you know, it's really interesting to think about how um, just changing that frame from leadership is something that I have the power to distribute to leadership is something that that is endemic in everyone and that we can collectively access. Mm. Let me just underscore that leadership is endemic in everyone and we can collectively access. That feels really good. It feels like a better match for the world we're in. Yeah, I sometimes also like to sort of imagine it almost like a a pool that's there, like a pool of water and anyone can just, you know, tap into it. And at Mm -hmm. different moments, different people are taking, you know, different Mm -hmm. amounts of water from it. Um, But it's like, Mm -hmm. sort of, it's there everywhere all the time and, and might be just tapped into. 
Yeah, I also it, do find that like it's quite interesting here maybe to bring in Alana's full circle leadership model also because I do think that part of part of shifting that mindset to leadership is something that anyone can access and be be doing as a as a verb is really broadening our understanding of what leadership even is mm. and that most of the time traditionally we always think of leadership as being a visionary kind of activity and that actually I mean this is what the full circle leadership model I think portrays really well is that there's so many different facets of how leadership can show up and I think uh yeah broadening that out of like what could a leader actually be in a given moment it really shifts your understanding and I think it helps more people feel like oh if that's also leading then then I do that too right yeah Mm -hmm. I mean not, not only how it shows up but how many different um, modalities of leadership are necessary for a healthy, healthy, uh, healthy yeah. operating organism, right? Like the idea that you're right, that our, our predominant version of a leader is that visionary, but also we need that operationalizing energy and that measurement energy and that stabilizing energy and that contextualizing energy and that prototyping energy, all of those all of those dimensions of leadership are necessary and happen all the time that the, the quandary we're in is that we don't recognize that as we, I think maybe that we do recognize it as leadership when it's happening, but we don't uh, announce it or value it or name it as leadership. Hmm. Hmm. I want to just highlight the thing that you just talked about, Susan, which is doing that in the moment. You know, thank you for your leadership on X. Yes. Yes. You know, making, make, drawing the relationship between the leadership energy you just occupied and this particular, you know, flavor of it, the opera, opera, operalization, opera, say this word for me. Operationalization. <laughs> Thank you, that one. You know, like maybe that's how the leadership flavor showed up in that moment. And, um, you know, I think it's also important to say, I'm following you, yeah. followership is as important as leadership it's something happened recently where someone you know, we were just sort of dithering about you know what are we going to do and then someone had an idea and I said okay I'm following your energy and they came back to me and said that was so important for me to hear because otherwise I put these offers out and then there's nothing I don't know if I can now have you know like the mantle to go forth and and to start to do this thing that I've suggested. Yeah, the power of the first follower, right? I definitely feel like there's many projects where because there was one person that said, oh yes, I think this is great and I'm with you and I wanna like be part of it, that that's actually what makes it Mm -hmm. happen. (laughs) Without that second person, it wouldn't. You know, don't a lot of people have a fear that if we don't have those visionary leaders out front or that or that or that leadership is not always visionary that we're sort of in a in a leaderless landscape like a no man's land of leaderlessness i mean i i i i haven't personally seen that but what i have seen again is this paradox that well if everybody's a leader then nobody's a leader you know if we're if we are if we're if we're equal E- equivalentizing or equalizing our leadership then who's actually steering who's actually driving um i i think i see and experience that more than specifically that um visionary leader because i know i work with lots of organizations and seen lots um where like that captain that stabilizer is very clearly the leader um and yeah and hmm. I mean, it's a really interesting point because I think that definitely in a lot of the the sort of collectives or organizations that are drawn towards self-organizing, they do tend to have quite an aversion to leadership. And Mm -hmm. my impression is that a lot of the people have had bad experiences of leadership in the past that were very power over. So they sort of just like reject it as a whole Mm -hmm. and are like, okay, none of us is going to lead. And there's sort of like this huge void that then just gets created. And so you actually get yeah like the worst because there's no leadership at all Mm -hmm. yeah I I I wrote something ages ago that um a leader just 
throwing their leadership into the middle of the circle is kind of an act of violence because it's like, it, it's just a void, right? Um, so I do, that's definitely not the answer. But I'd like to just poke a little bit more front on what you said about um, uh, organizations that uh, the startups, the young younger Web three spaces where um, the organizations are started with the intention of being as low hierarchy as possible. What do you think is behind this aversion to leadership? Mm. I is mean, it just I, the I bad think, experience or is it something else? I mean, I definitely think that like there's the ideology of decentralization that is sort of uh, around in different areas and that there can be something very, very um, radical about it sometimes of like everything must be decentralized and that there's almost this uh, obsession with automating things and taking humans out fully. So in a way like our way to avoid that some other individual is going to coerce us, we create a system that runs itself that then uh, will oppress us, I think. But basically the idea being that uh, there are these certain values or ideas that are encoded into it and that will make sure that that never happens. Yeah, and um, I can guarantee you that what happens is that conflict with the system uh, then some human in the system becomes the proxy for that conflict and gets blamed anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really just sidestepping the main question, which is about conscious use of power. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that, that's what it comes down to is like just being really aware of this is one up, one down dynamic that we as mammals do all the time, you know, and, and how can we become conscious about that? And um, and not oppress each other with it, but also not ignore that it exists. I mean, I think and that we just lack good examples of, mm -hmm. of people stepping into leadership, stepping into their power in a way that inspires us and makes us say, oh, I want to do that too. Not, oh my God, I don't want to be that person. Like, it makes me think of Susan looking at her boss who was, you know, picking on people and thinking, oh, I guess if I want to, <laughs> go somewhere in this company I need to be like that but being like oh I'm not sure I want to be like that we want the opposite right mm -hmm. yeah well you know it's just a lot more messy so and, and the it that I'm talking about is the 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 self-organizing field where people are free to take leader leadership when they have the the energy the the mandate in some way, maybe they're an expert in this thing, or maybe they have the most time or whatever it is, you know, that, that um, it's going to require a lot more real conversations. And so now we're mm -hmm. back to the adult to adult thing versus the parent child thing, right? Adults have to learn how to have these conversations with each other. So I'm curious, um, there's something that I feel like I've observed as a dynamic, and I don't know if you've experienced this as well, which is that I think often people think leadership is like a scarce resource. Mm -hmm. And so if I step in, then there's less left for others, which is the opposite dynamic of, oh, someone's stepping in. Oh, that makes me also feel like I can also step in. But that somehow it's like, yeah, one person's occupying the space and then therefore it's taken and that it's not something that's really available in abundance. And I feel like that's underlying a lot of the, the behaviors that I tend to see. I think because that in some way, even in a different from a different perspective, is reminiscent of the old power structure. Mm. That 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 still needs to be um mm. we still need to unlearn that. That's that's what mm. how I feel that um quandary in my body when you talk about it yeah yeah there's another sort of categorization of leadership you probably heard heroic leadership and post-heroic leadership and the the whole post-heroic idea is what you're talking about Fran. the ability that some that that anyone could step in at any time um but we are still 
suffering from the hangover of imbibing too much heroic leadership, you know? So, so yeah. we're still, we're still sort of like a little hungover from that. And, and we're not trusting it when someone steps in that there actually still is pl- abundant room for everyone else to step in, yeah. you know, that we, that we can all be leaders and it does not require a hero. And I feel like, I feel like that the, the middle version of that over the past decade, which I personally don't think has done us any favors is this concept of servant leadership. Like I'm here, I'm here at your service because you need me and I, I am here to serve you. I think that that, that if anything does double down on that parent child thing, Mm -hmm. Um, just from a slightly different perspective. And and maybe it's a developmental stage that this needed to go through um, from Mm -hmm. that hero through the servant to post-heroic. It's super interesting, yeah. yeah. Because I definitely, I remember when I first had heard about it, it really resonated a lot with me uh, Mm -hmm. when I was very active in WeShare and was definitely someone who was sort of in charge of a lot of things, let's say. And I definitely think that uh, I, I was, I mean, I was quite a parent child, like the very loving, supportive, I'm yes. here to help you grow parent mm-hmm. in that context. And yeah, I've definitely had to had to move through that and uh, recognize that, yeah, servant leadership is not not a useful framing, but it's yeah. sort of hidden, hidden in sheep's wool or what. Yeah. So, yeah. Here, oh. so here, I really, really, really <laughs> want to defend Robert Greenleaf here because <laughs> so much of the, of what people have built on his work has distorted his work. Of like the, his original work was called servant as leader it wasn't called servant leader it wasn't called servant leadership it was not like i'm subservient to you and i'm sort of doing this sort of backhanded mothering of you it wasn't really that at all um it, it was actually a very the way i re- read it this is from the 1970s but i but i just love the original work called servant as leader and the way i read it was that you know, this is really sort of a very upright and authentic and honest kind of position mm. of, of not having power over people, but also not being subservient to them. Because there's a sort of like an edge to the servant as leader, like the servant, the servant sees something, right? Yeah. From their position, they see something that other people aren't seeing or they're not willing to see. And the servant is the one to say it. And this is just such a great example of how things get twisted all the time. They do. Right? They do. So. You know, like this whole self-management thing, like and coming back to what we were talking about before that, oh, so if everybody is self-managing themselves, who's in charge, who's responsible, who's accountable. And it's like, can you just take a breath and like back up? Okay. That's not. I can see where you could go there with that, but let's take a step back to actually interrogate the real possibilities here. Hmm. It's also interesting because I was just thinking back to what you were saying before about visionary leadership and people like wanting that or yearning for it. And obviously we need it. But I also think that, especially with the growing uh, uncertain environment that we live in nowadays, that keeps getting more uncertain, let's say, I think that also we're really, really uncomfortable with those, in a way, gaps between when we have a vision and then we're not clear, and then we need to figure out, okay, what's what's the next step or where are we going as a group with this project? So yeah, I think um, something about collectively needing to learn better at being okay with, we don't know right now. Like maybe right now we just don't have a vision because we just... We don't have what we need to actually be clear on that and that it will come. But yeah, I think uh, that's really uncomfortable to do. And I definitely see people, yeah, really therefore sometimes like calling in a quite traditional form of leadership because it's so uncomfortable to sit with that Mm -hmm. uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now we're into inner development. We could do an entire show on people's inner development and what's required there. I think we should next season and next season. (laughs) I thought, I also think that we should do an entire show Fran, on your cut the bullshit article. Um, (laughs) uh, You know, there's no such thing as no hierarchy, but leadership like hierarchy is dynamic and can be dynamic. And really, I, I think that that framing is 
again, the aspiration of that is incredible. The practice of that is the hardest thing you're ever going to do. So I was, I'm quite curious, I guess, before we close, what you all think are some of the things where we are struggling with in greater than when it comes to leadership, because obviously we're really trying to practice all these things we're talking about, mm. but it's not easy. <laughs> I mean, I think friend, when you, when you were sharing that um, anecdote about the the sense that somebody's in the space so there's no more space i i feel like that was a, li a little bit of um self projection um mm -hmm. that because of your tenure in the collective that i do believe um that and i probably it probably applies to me and probably some some of the rest of us who have been around a while that um if we're occupying the safe then it is somehow um maybe not, maybe not a safe, not, maybe not a space that is being held or colonized by us, but that it's safe. It's in safe hands. I don't need to think about that or worry okay, about that I'll, because it's in safe hands. Yeah. I'll speak as the newbie, you know, someone who has yeah. plenty of leadership experience herself. If I see that one of you's got it, I'm like, I don't need to worry about it. Hmm. That's how I feel about it when yeah. I see, when I see you occupy a space. Okay, great. They've got it. I can focus on other things. So, and so what do you, what do you think could shift that for us and for you? Well, I think it would take some like really explicit stepping out of mm -hmm. spaces to, to make it so that I would step in. Yeah. I, I am finding the places where I step in sort of naturally where I'm, I'm getting to unlearn the, the sort of waiting that I've been taught to do. Mm -hmm. I've sort of been conditioned to do. Like and waiting for waiting to be invited or waiting till you think the time is right. Or, or waiting to both. see if someone else comes in too. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 So this is part of my own um, development journey of moving from heroic to post-heroic leadership is sort of just seeing is someone else gonna step in. So great. Let them let them run with it. I don't need to be doing everything. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think there is certainly no dearth of leadership in greater than, but the way that we're yeah. I think we could be more explicit about followership. And I think that's mm -hmm. why it came up for me a couple of times, couple of times in this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of move, 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 move in greater than, which is great. But if we're always moving and there's not enough energy to sustain the things we're moving on and not enough followership, then we're not gonna be able to, to do them fully. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, one thing that I've noticed not just in greater than, but also some of the other groups I'm in. I'm calling this now the, the tyranny of duocracy, which duocracy being basically another term for anyone can step in and be, take responsibility for things. And if they're doing something, they they get legitimacy um, in, in what they're doing. They can make decisions, basically. Oh, I think I get it. So duocracy, mm -hmm. like people are doing, the ones that exactly. are doing. Exactly. Okay. Yes. yes. Got it. The ones who okay. are doing, they get the power basically. Uh -huh. And I mean, we use this a lot and we share, but I think what I've seen happen and maybe it's a hangover because a lot of people have been in, we share and in spiral from greater than, and have sort of maybe, uh, yeah, been a bit traumatized by that dynamic and brought it into greater than, I don't know, but it's basically this fear that if you share an idea, then you are going to be expected to lead it to, to happen. And so that then therefore, mm -hmm. often people hold back from sharing ideas or solutions because they're afraid that everyone's going to say, oh, great, great idea. So what are you going to do about it? Because yeah. anyone can do something about it. And why don't you, if you're bringing it up? That's right. Because so the, think... the, the pair to the um, tyranny of bureaucracy is the tyranny of someone should. And that's been really inculcated that never bring something with the with the phrase somebody should if you're bringing it it's on you exactly and i think that that's a real shadow and uh yeah yeah has made me think that we need to create spaces where we're saying okay right now we're just doing ideas or bringing up whatever and we're not going to be attributing who's going to then have to do what so that you don't uh, fall <laughs> can into can we that please i like awesome. it yeah. yeah yet another place to be explicit you know yeah yeah Exactly. 
Well, so much to explore on this topic. I'm sure that we'll do some more episodes to probably unpack other pieces. I think uh, any any other closing thoughts that we want to share before we leave for today? I think the closing thought I would leave with is like the mess is worth it. It, it, it might look like hierarchical leadership is cleaner and maybe even more effective in some ways, but I don't think it's a match for the current environment we're in and the mess is worth it. I just think the upside is so strong of um, creating the conditions for everybody to be leaderful. And yeah, the upside is just so much, so much higher than the current state. I love that thought. And yeah, the mess is worth it. That's a good note to end on. And so looking forward to seeing you all in our next episode. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.